Right. Um, well, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for coming today. Um, and without further ado, I'm going to launch straight into this talk, uh, which will be touching a little bit on beavers, where they've been in the past, where we're up to now in, 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 in uh, Europe and Britain, and, um, and what we're hoping for in the future. And I will try and talk for no more than half an hour and leave lots of time for questions, because as ever, the questions will reveal the light. Okay. And now for some reason, oh, yeah, there we go. Okay, so a bit about me. I'm um, uh, a, a simple soul, uh, an organic livestock farmer for most of my life. I've done a few other things as well, but that, that's been the sort of the ongoing theme uh, running through. Um, I'm the instigator of the Cornwall Beaver Project, which uh, commenced in 2014, following uh, flooding in Laddock in 2012 and 2013. Um, I had, I confess, been long beaver curious before that, um, and the flooding in Laddock sort of gave me the excuse uh, to have a real go at trying to get some beavers. Um, and following on from that, uh, in 2019, I was a founder of Beaver Trust, and I'm currently the director of Communities and Land for that organisation. Okay, so just a little bit about beavers themselves. Um, a big, second only to the capybara in uh, rodent world. Um, 18 to 30 kgs is, 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 a, is a sort of typical range. They average quite low down in that range, but they can be really, really big. Um, obviously got the diagnostic paddle tail used for lots of things like uh, um, extra propulsion when they're in a hurry and as a rudder and as a, a balancing uh, tool when they're lifting things up on their hind legs. Um, used for storage of fat, communications with other beavers uh, and indeed communications with other species too because they'll they'll sometimes slap at you just so that you know that they know that you're there. Um, quite interesting all that stuff. Uh, they've got very strongly webbed hind feet. Very strong claws on their front feet, but uh, they're also very, very dexterous uh, front feet or, the, uh, or their paws, very, very, very dexterous. Then they can uh, reach things down, bring them to their mouth. They can, they can um, mold mud around things. Uh, they don't have a thumb as such, but they use their, their, uh, their smallest digit uh, as a bit of a thumb as well. So they, they're just in, incredibly dexterous. Uh, as well as being tough. I should say that uh, the, these animals, they burrow a lot. They probably burrow nearly as much as they build, which most people don't realise. Very adapted to the aquatic lifestyle. Um, their head is, is uh, very flat and the ostral, nostrils, eyes and ears are all in one plane uh, and at the top of the head. So they can lie like a crocodile does, very, very low in the water and yet have good um, sensory awareness of what's going on around them. Famously orange teeth impregnated with iron on the anterior surface of the teeth. Um, the posterior surface is just ordinary dentine and so it means the teeth, they, they wear differentially and thus remain sharp. Lips close behind, um, uh, that, or can close behind their teeth, uh, so that if they're underwater and chewing through a root, let's say, they don't drown. Very handy for them. Um, coat of two layers, and this really is what got them into trouble, the, 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 the bottom layer. The, the top layer is fairly sparse of, of long guard hairs. The bottom layer is very, very dense. And she soft. says, I'll definitely be back in your own words. Each strand of that hair has a little hook on it. Uh, so uh, when they're underwater and the uh, water pressure is acting on it, it 
seals really well and helps to keep the skin dry underneath all, all, all of that. And um, because of that, it is perfect for producing a very thin, soft and waterproof felt. Uh, and of course, uh, famously used in hat production for centuries. Okay, and there he is, uh, or she is, in fact, just gobbling up a piece of bramble. Uh, see its tail sitting out behind them. Very, very, very typical uh, on the bank pose. Okay, just thinking about their uh, ecology. These animals are arch disruptors. They absolutely change everything around them. Um, if it's a deep river, they'll burrow into the banks and eventually potentially cause bank collapse. They'll take out trees, so letting light in. Uh, they'll uh, end up with lots of bits of uh, a wooden detritus in the river, which then provides shelter uh, and cover for all sorts of um, uh, young fish and inverts and so on. So they have a, a disproportionately a great impact on on, uh, on their environment. Um, they are, I think, one of the few really, really key keystone species around. Um, in if they don't have the amount of water that they need uh, to uh, occupy a territory with their dam building, they'll create it. So they really are very, very special and very disruptive. So they, they want to have deep water so they're protected uh, from predator. You know, they have evolved quite literally in the presence of lions and tigers and leopards and wolves and bears and lynxes. Um, if you think about their range, which is from uh, historically their range or prehistorically, I should say, their range from the west of Wales through to the east of Siberia, down into China, uh, to Mongolia, down into the Holy Land, uh, Syria, Persia, this kind of area, uh, down to the shores of the Mediterranean, and uh, it, it, even even in relatively modern times, there have been some really really big, uh, dangerous predators. And to any of those animals, a beaver is just a nice, handy twenty kg package. Of fat and protein, um, ungainly on land, not very quick, so a, a really easy meal. And in fact, uh, there are places around uh, in North America, certainly, and I believe in Eastern Europe as well, where there, where there are packs of wolves that actually have a considerable proportion of their of their living is from predating beavers. Okay, so they they need water for their protection. They want to have a, a depth of at least 60 centimetres to provide a covered entrance to a, their lodge or their burrow. If they're in a big river with a high bank, they may not even build a lodge, they might just have a burrow um, uh, and live in that. But where the banks are not very very high, they will build the burrow, uh, sorry, they'll build the, uh, uh, the uh, lodge on top of uh, on top of the burrow and then of course the lodge itself becomes habitat for other uh, animals as we go along. They're very strongly territorial. The family group is uh, the two parent animals plus their new kits and then the previous year's kits. Older kits leave the family. Um, as they become sexually mature, they have to go. And if they don't, the parents will drive them out. The territory, which somewhat depends on, on, on uh, the quality of the habitat and the degree of competition, could be anywhere from 500 meters 
in a place where there's lots of competition, but still good resources, uh, to maybe 10 kilometers of stream where there's no competition or, or not very good resources. Um, and they are uh, apt to die in defense of those territories or indeed kill other beavers in order to maintain them. There is uh, a great deal of evidence to, to suggest that uh, in the absence of predation, their population will not become uh, uh, uncontrollable because they'll control themselves with their um, uh, with their uh, territorial fighting. And indeed, there is evidence to suggest that uh, as a pair, uh, a pair of adults go beyond uh, their breeding life, they will still maintain a territory. So they may no longer be pr providing new beavers into a population, uh, but still defending their territory uh, and uh, rendering it um, unavailable to other beavers. Right, and I've mentioned this about them being a keystone species. Uh, and they really do support everything from algae right through to mammals. And something uh, which I, I kind of observe, I've not seen any writing on it, uh, but I know uh, that Imperial College are actually doing some work on this right now. Uh, the fact that they slow down what would otherwise be rapidly moving water gives algae chance to get going. And as we know, algae uh, uh, phytoplankton is the basis of all aquatic food chains. And in our inland waters, uh, that ex the, the, the effect on the food chain or the food web extends beyond the, uh, the, the boundaries of the actual stream itself. So um, they're incredibly important for the life. They are utterly herbivorous. They are, if you like, uh, um, specialized generalists. They eat just about everything. The, the list of things that they would never touch uh, is incredibly uh, slim. And, um, you know, at, at our place, we see them eating uh, things that they really oughtn't to, like a water hemlock without uh, turning a hair. Uh, there are some trees we know that they have a preference. Uh, for and some we know that they're less uh, fond of but believe me if they run out of what they're fond of they go straight on to the next thing and start eating it um, or consuming it so um, they can cope in a very wide range of circumstances they're very very good at modifying the vegetation uh, next to uh, a, a stream or river next to their uh, next to their aquatic bit of the territory. Um, the tendency is for them to stay within about 20 meters of the water uh, and it's all about um, survival. They will go further if they have to. You know they respond uh, to two things in life really. One is uh, social push, i.e. parents getting rid of them or um, other, other dangerous beavers nearby keeping them away but also they respond to resource pull. So if there's something that they really like more than 20 meters away, they will go and get it. At risk to themselves, of course. One of the big uh, things they do obviously is to, is to fell trees. Um, they only eat uh, leaves and really the cambium layer of the bark. So it's very common to see uh, uh, trees with bark stripped off them um, as high up as a beaver can reach, or indeed once they're felled, felled depending on the kind of tree, uh, uh, more or less of the bark consumed. And then they use some of it for building dams and lodges if they need to. But quite often, uh, wood is just left to, uh, to, to decompose uh, in situ. They don't take everything away with them, or very rarely do they. And of course, this is great for ecology again because of the whole uh, dead wood ecosystem, which is, as we know, so uh, relatively unusual in, in our uh, context here. Okay, we break up canopy with, it, with these uh, trees being 
cut down, letting light light in uh, and uh, providing food and shelter for a whole host of other things. Now I just mentioned uh, that they break up uh, existing ground cover. This is at the Cornwall Beaver Project. And what you can see there is the brambles. If you were standing there, there would be about chest high. The brambles underneath the, uh, the woodland cover that's there. That is pre-beaver. And here it is, uh, a slightly different view, but in the same area. This is where the beavers have been uh, getting in amongst it. Uh, and you'll see there are now other things growing there, uh, in particular ferns, but there's also grasses and rushes and so on beginning to come through as well, as the brambles have been disrupted. You end up with this, which is tantamount to being a beaver lawn now. Very, very few brambles left. Uh, gaps in the canopy, more light coming through and lots of grasses and sedges appearing as well. And of course, as the, the ground cover becomes more diverse, more uh, species can come and take advantage of that with the beavers. And just uh, to show you this, this is a, a little clearing that they created uh, just last autumn, not even a year ago. Um, the picture was taken very recently uh, and you can see they've um, got rid of all of the, uh, of the ground vegetation and just a little bit of regrowth now of, of um, rushes and mosses and the odd fern coming through. Most of the wood just left there. The, the stream itself is just five meters away to the left and they've removed all the small stuff uh, and gone down there and then stripped the bark. And uh, th this, this little area now will either eventually cover over in brambles again, but I think that's unlikely because now they've opened it up, they'll probably go in there and further uh, open up the sort of the, the brambles we can see in front of us. Most of the trees that they cut are in fact coppiced. And this coppice growth in itself is a lovely food source for them. Um, you know, one or two year old willow is just perfect for snacks, perfect for little beavers to uh, cope with um, and quite often see uh, parent, parents taking small diameter uh, coppice regrowth into the lodge in the evening for the uh, for the youngsters to snack on. But you get this very, very uh, 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 much more patchy um, a kind of uh, a woodland effect, slightly stunted because a lot of the tall trees have gone, but uh, very, very dense uh, patches of, of, of coppice regrowth. And of course, that's good for all sorts of other things. And with a diagnostic dead tree lying in the foreground. And there, just for the sheer hell of it, is a young kit. It's actually crossing um, the dam in the main main sort of lodge pond that our beavers have created. Okay, so let's just look at their range in old times and the population. So we've mentioned the range. It's Im impossible to know what the population size was but my suspicion is that by the time let's say the Roman conquest of Britain their uh, population was already under severe stress across lots of their range. Um, simply put beavers are very very easy to catch compared to a lot of other things quite decent meat and fur and other things you can get from them and uh, I, I just think they wouldn't have been able to put up with with human uh, human predation um, but based on what we know from North America 
I think we think that uh, the Eurasian beaver numbered in the hundreds of millions if we go back to, let's say, uh, the end of the last ice age. I haven't mentioned castorium um, used uh, in herbal medicine, uh, the connection between salicylic acid and, uh, and castorium is, is a sort of unknown quantity, um, but also used in vanilla flavoring. Think of that. Think of the anal gland when you're eating your ice cream um, and in perfume. So, you know, by the 16th century, um, when they allegedly became extinct in uh, Britain, they were probably functionally extinct across a great deal of their range. And indeed, luckily, about the same time as they're really, really going south uh, here, uh, they were replaced by the North American beaver in the fur trade. And indeed, the North American beaver uh, provided the basis for the, the, uh, the felt hat trade for the next 200 years. So there we go, that's what it looks like. Um, uh, just the most incredible range. Um, I know we're not absolutely sure about uh, how far they went across to the uh, east coast of Siberia, but there's no, no reason to suppose they wouldn't have because the habitat's there. And here it is today, you know, we, we went down to, if you look in the yellow, it, it's what they call the, the, uh, the refugia, quite big blobs in, in parts of uh, modern Russia, Belarus, Ukraine. They were very, very sparse within those areas. Um, also uh, present uh, just in uh, Germany on the Elbe. In southern France, in the Camargue, and in Norway, there were, we think, around about 1,200 animals left across those areas at the uh, turn of the 19th, 20th century. So really, really, really close to, uh, perilously close to complete extinction. So they were given protection just about everywhere across, across their range uh, at plus minus the end of the 19th century. And the animals started to uh, rebound in numbers and began to be the subject of reintroductions. For example, in Bavaria, which is now quite famous uh, um, for its beavers now, they, the uh, government released 100 beavers into the Dan Danube in 1966. Today, there were 25,000 of them. They provided the seed stock for uh, introducing beavers to many other European countries. And today, uh, they are about 2,000 culled annually. Now, um, it would be much better if they were not having to cull those animals, of course, uh, but it's necessary to do that in order to keep uh, conflict down with um, a variety of human activities, but including farming. But it says to me that that is a pretty healthy uh, population and it strikes me as being an overwhelming conservation success. If we can keep people quiet who are being impacted by beavers, um, and that, that's got to be a good thing. So today we're probably around about 1.3 million beavers, um, Eurasian beavers a tiny fraction of what there was um, a few thousand years ago, but growing. And uh, I would imagine they're going to continue to grow for a long time to come. And already in some places, they're becoming a resource 
Uh, I think in Belarus now they 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 actually become a resource again. Uh, it will be interesting to see there if they try to over exploit it or if it uh, if they can uh, exploit just a sustainable sustainable number of the animals. Hi, Chris. I'm um, sorry to interrupt. Can um, your camera has just gradually migrated to so your head? It's got smaller and smaller on the screen. Can you just back up so you can see your glorious face again? <laughs> There we are. That's much better. I love that. That's much better. I, 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 I think I have a better face for radio. <laughs> I'm not saying anything. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, where are we to? And now my screen has frozen. Well, at least we can see. Oh, there we go. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Different countries have very markedly different approaches to the animal in terms of uh, regulation. Um, Norway and Sweden, for example, that, that there's no form of protection apart from a close season, and they are otherwise just a normal quarry species. Having said that, the numbers in both of those countries are uh, on the up. Um, I, earlier this year, I was in a national park in Sweden uh, which had, um, it was based on a, a, a lake and they had three discrete populations of beavers within that lake. Uh, it was a place where they have uh, the interface between um, broadleaf woodland and pretty much purely coniferous woodland. And so they were very, very concerned in a special uh, ecological zone on, on tree losses. So they actually culled beavers there. Um, they still ha have hunting of other things within, within the national park uh, and they were depending on the hunters uh, controlling the beavers as well. It has not worked out very well because hunters want to shoot exciting things like moose um, and uh, beavers, hunting of beavers is just a distraction. Plus also it happens after dark and, and so on. So it's just not very interesting for them at all. Um, in other places, like uh, Germany, for example, they have a, a European protected species status. And although they cull beavers there, that is all done very strictly under license. However, the uh, Germans are supremely pragmatic people and um, they, they have a very, very slick uh, um, approach to removing beavers, which are causing problems. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm just, uh, wondering if we can actually be as, as slick here as they are there, because one of the things that's been observed in Bavaria um, in terms of keeping the public on board, uh, and particular the stakeholders such as farmers um, and water engineers, you need to respond really quickly to a problem. Um, and we'll see whether that's gonna work here or not. Okay. Uh, so what's happening in Britain? We, we lost all our beavers um, 400 years ago. There's some argument about whether uh, in this parish record or that parish record that, that, that a, a beaver was killed in the 1800s or the 1700s. And it may have been, but you know, uh, my, my firm belief is that they were functionally extinct across Britain hundreds and hundreds of years ago. Uh, for example, where I am in Cornwall, I can't imagine that they survived uh, into Roman times, even because it was relatively densely populated. It's a peninsula uh, and, and uh, extinctions happen really fast in peninsulas and indeed on islands. And there would have just been nowhere for beavers to have come from to restock the place. So, uh, um, I, I, and also it was relatively densely populated uh, 2000 years ago. So I, I think most of Britain has been without beavers for, for a long, long time. Anyway, um, there was interest in bringing beavers back in the 1960s. Uh, I believe uh, the Forestry Commission in Grisdale were interested in the idea of bringing beavers back there uh, in the 1960s and their, their requests were just gently squashed. Um, coming forward, we began to get interested in uh, rewilding and what have you in the 1980s and 90s. And um, beavers were imported, Eurasian beavers were imported. Uh, and eventually 
some were uh, released into a, an enclosure in Kent at Ham Fen under Kent Wildlife Trust. And then not long afterwards, they began turning up in the River Stour. In Scotland, beavers came into Tayside um, just about the same time as they uh, uh, arrived in, uh, in Kent and went into a couple of enclosures in uh, the Upper Tay and not long afterwards began to be observed uh, colonising the rest of Tayside. Um, Knapdale came later, this is the uh, official Scottish beaver trial and um, they nearly got going in the early 2000s but then in, in the end uh, it wasn't until 2009 that they were released there um, uh, when they were already broadly speaking unacknowledged but already some hundreds probably in uh, in Tayside uh, and in Scotland they were uh, having declared the success of the uh, Napdale project um, they were granted EPS, European Protected Species Status, in 2019, and uh, at the same time, the first lethal control uh, license were issued. Uh, so in England, there have been a series of enclosures and escapes from enclosures, uh, not least of which was uh, our own Cornwall Beaver Project, which we commenced in actually with beavers inside an enclosure in 2017, having a three years working up to it. Um, and there are now, I uh, believe, something like 30 um, enclosures across the country, some of which have leaked, some of which haven't. Uh, and some of that leakage resulted in the River Otter Beaver trial because wild beavers were observed there uh, by someone it became public knowledge and um, uh, I'm not quite, quite sure the root of this but anyway DEFRA then wanted to remove these beavers there was a a, a considerable local uh, campaign launched saying no we want to keep our beavers thank you and um, in the end a, a license was applied for by Devon Wildlife Trust and granted to to monitor that that species and, and run it as a as a scientific trial so we could learn what we could about wild living beavers. Um, alongside that was the Beaver Advisory Group in England started up uh, with the likes of Derek Gow and Charlie Burrell and uh, Rasheen Campbell Palmer and various of the great and good from the um, science world coming together. Uh, to promote the idea of, uh, of more widespread beaver colonization. Um, beaver Trust formed in uh, 2019 as well. And just to give you some idea of how things have moved on, um, without giving away any place names, I'm sure you know lots of them anyway, this just shows the increase in rivers that I'm prepared to acknowledge, uh, which uh, has grown over the last 15, 20 to 15, uh, 15 to 20 years in Britain. And I think this, this number is going to get longer quite quickly. Um, I would add, apart from the Napdale beavers, these have all been unlicensed activities, basically. Uh, bearing in mind the River Otter beavers, although they got a license, it was a retrospective one. So there we are. Um, apart from the River Tay, this has by and large been, been uh, without any outcry from uh, farmers um, and uh, not, not too much public knowledge by and large. Um, and it just goes to show that this large mammal can actually exist pretty close to people without causing too much difficulty in most circumstances. I would add to that, there are circumstances where they can be a real pain, and we can talk about that in Q&A if we like. Um, so, the Trust is uh, campaigning for acceptance and tolerance of these animals. Uh, 
uh, and we are indeed uh, campaigning for much wider release. And it's helped with a general zeitgeist of rewilding, which has really taken off and shows no sign whatever uh, of, uh, of dimming. Um, there's a, 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 an absolutely fundamental enthusiasm for, for this amongst a very wide um, portion of, of the population of this country, including some farmers. Uh, Brent Garrow has been very much the fore in this. I'm sure you all have heard of him and his activities. And uh, I, he, he was involved with beavers right from the very word go in Kent and other places. We trust pushing all the time. So yesterday, for example, I was with the Conservative Environment Network um, staff just uh, pushing the beaver message. Plus legal changes to coming to, uh, uh, to, to us here uh, in October this year, we've been told, and I don't think they can get out of this. Now, I think this is really, really going to happen at last. Uh, there will be protected status from the 1st of October this year. Um, what we don't know yet officially is what the management uh, is going to look like uh, of, the, uh, of the wild beaver um, or indeed exactly what licensing of new beaver populations is going to look like. Um, so there's a lot to play for still. Right. With the, with the consultation last year, which I'm sure many of you will have seen, if not actually replied to, there is, there is this evolving regulation. We don't know exactly what it's like yet, it, but it is coming. And it's looking like uh, any, any new wild release catchment will have to have a beaver management group formed. Uh, we'll have to have a, a full-time beaver officer. Um, and a ho it will have to prove it's got funding for 12 months, um, sorry, 12 months, for, for uh, up to 10 years, and so on and so forth. So it's, it's pretty heavy duty. There are several already which are kind of ready to go. We're just waiting for, for the green light to actually stick applications in. And there are lots and lots of places, and again, I'm sure lots of people in this call will be aware of, if not actually taking part in uh, projects up and down, which have got the aspiration for, for, uh, for beavers. So just to speculate a bit, currently about 40 or so are trans translocated annually from Tayside lethal control areas. That is the only practical source of beavers uh, for England at the moment. Ideally with this whole families, uh, but with growing opportunities uh, for this in Scotland, England, and Wales, and it may be that if if we could if we could uh, uh, have licences granted for uh, catchment wild release, we would be able to up those numbers moved out of the the lethal protection area. You know, at the moment we are only allowed to trap beavers which are under a um, under a lethal control license. So I think we want to see beavers on most rivers. I'd hesitate to say I'd hesitate to say all because some of our rivers uh, would I think lead to very severe uh, conflict. Um, we can talk about those later if you want. We think the idea of a beaver management group for every river catchment is a nonsense. Um, or that is to say, it could be easily done by regional bodies, such as happens in, in Bavaria. Um, you know, for, for every river to have its own separate management group and so on seems to be a bit heavy. Um, with lots of pragmatic management and mitigation where it's needed. We want to see beavers really back as a normal part of, of British wildlife. You know, for me, we will have succeeded when beavers are no longer newsworthy. 
And as a part of bringing them back, well, in fact, even without bringing them back, we want to see riparian buffers established, established across the country. They, you know, our, our streams are in a terrible state, um, at least half of which is down to agriculture. So we firmly believe that, it, that we should have good buffers established across the, um, across our river system, by which I mean 20 meters plus, um, just so that we're not getting uh, uh, as much direct pollution coming in. Okay, um, thanks very much for listening. I think I've blathered on much too long. Uh, if anyone has any questions, I'll be really happy to answer them. Oh, we have so many questions. <laughs> okay, well, I'll, I'll try and answer them quickly. Right, this, um, okay, let's do some nice ones first. Um, so do beavers and otters coexist, do we know? Yes, they uh, do. beavers provide job opportunities for otters, kingfishers, herons, water voles, fish, you name it. They're, they're, they're good for just about everything. Amazing. Um, another one on impact of other species. Um, do beaver dams inhibit fish migration, i.e. returning to spawning grounds and things? What I observe is uh, when a when a beaver first builds uh, in, a, in a stream, there will be a period when the dam is essentially blocking. But after a while, once the stream is reconnected with its floodplain, it has to go around. And certainly in, in the case of the Cornwall Beaver Project, every dam essentially comes with a free fish pass. Now, um, in some places, uh, the, the dams never really get chance uh, uh, to become long lived because in the winter they just blow out. Um, uh, and so, so some dams become very, very permanent and very, very uh, available for fish to pass through a system, such as I observe in other places that they are uh, more ephemeral, let's say. That's really interesting. So, um, so really, the answer is no. They don't provide permanent uh, uh, blockages of fish passage. And, uh, you know, when, when there's a lot of water in the river, that's when fish move up and down. You know, when the water is very, very low, they don't move very much because they, they can't. Uh, but when there's lots of water there, the water's higher energy. And that's when, when the, the, the dams can either blow out, allow fish passage, or um, the, 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 the different factors come into play. But if we think about it, uh, fish, our fish co-evolve with beavers. Do we imagine that there were more salmon 10,000 years ago? Do we imagine that? Or do we think there were fewer when there were lots of beavers? You know, I, th I think it, 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 it intuitively we know uh, it, it's not the end of the world for fish. Beautiful. Um, I've got some on diet, so I'm just going to talk about these and then you can answer the questions all together. Um, so first of all, Dan's asking, um, due to their huge diet range, um, could they potentially be used for biological control of things like Himalayan um, balsam? Um, Rebecca's asking, do they eat bracken? And Jess is asking, do they have like a, pr a preference of particular trees or, or foods or do they just go for it? OK, um, uh, bracken, I've not seen that uh, personally, but I have seen them eat lots of other ferns. So I, I don't think that, that Bracken would put them off. Um, uh, what was the first bit? Um, do they, would they be, could they be used um, for biological control? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I think not. They do eat Himalayan balsam. They do eat uh, Japanese knotweed. You know, it, they eat just about everything. But do they uh, eat one thing to the exclusion of all else? No. Uh, so, so, you know, we just got to uh, um, bite the bullet there, really. Uh, and then the last one, do they have preferences? Yes, they do have preferences. Um, their number one thing is aspen, uh, and then uh, willow, uh, and then in sort of descending order of preferences, uh, the maples, um, oak, uh, holly, birch, um, until you get round to alder. They don't like alder very much. But when nothing else is there, they'll eat it. They're not very keen on conifers. But there was nothing else there, they'll eat it. Sounds like me and my fridge, to be quite honest with you. Yeah. Um, cool. I've got loads of questions about impact. Um, Shamal's asking, um, 
how do they impact um, human populations? Um, we've got people asking um, how how they impact rivers now that the land use around river systems has changed. All of this, um, things like um, above ground irrigation, could they be at risk? Um, do you want to go over some of the impacts they might have yeah. and how they might be mitigated yeah. for? Okay, so absolutely beavers have impacts. You know, they, beavers cause flooding. But the trick with them is if you can have that flooding taking place somewhere, it doesn't matter. Uh, to prevent flooding somewhere where it does matter, that seems like a, a, a superb ecosystem service. Um, uh, they, if we think about farming, uh, a lot of this is around the geographical context. If you've got uh, a landscape which is very, very flat and with uh, large rivers perched behind flood banks flowing through that landscape, then beavers can be incredibly serious. Uh, and this is why there's such conflict on the River Tay. And it's why there was conflict in Bavaria um, where they've got the Danube floodplain, which is incredibly intensively farmed. And it's why when they do get into the fens, um, uh, and I, I'm, I'm very firmly of the opinion we shouldn't be putting beavers anywhere near the fence if we can help it, um, is uh, with those landscapes, once they start to punch holes through uh, or into the flood banks to live in, they'll weaken and eventually they'll break. And then you can have, you know, hundreds of acres, hundreds of hectares flooded. And if that's full of carrots or potatoes or maize or something, that could be really, really serious. Um, they also predate, I say predate, they, they also uh, consume uh, things like uh, maize and uh, carrots and um, sugar beet with alacrity. They love those things. And so if you've got uh, that kind of farming right down from water's edge, again, look out. Um, again, it's a great reason to have a buffer built in. A, you'll stop pollution or as much pollution getting into the water, but also you'll keep the animals uh, a, a little bit further away from your crop. Is, 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 does that help? Yeah, I think so. I'll just unmute myself so you can hear me. Yeah, um, that's that's perfect. Um, I've got a couple of other veins of questions. So one's asking about um, self-regulation of populations. So at the beginning, you said that they do, to some extent, um, self-regulate. But then we're also talking about um, them being culled in certain areas. Do you want to comment on that any further? Or Well, ju just that um, um, if, if, they, if they're left to, the, to their own devices, uh, a population will will grow until such point as there isn't a um, uh, resource to go around, i.e. Uh, once, once all the available ter territories are taken up, then their population can't really grow anymore. D does that make sense? Yeah, so um, kind of their threshold might be a bit higher to what we want it to actually get to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. And in fact, um, uh, Pete Burgess from Devon Wildlife Trust, he talks about there being an ecological carrying carry capacity, which is, uh, let's say, um, 5,000 beavers in Devon, completely made up number. Um, uh, or you could then have the, the social carrying capacity, uh, which might only be 1,000 because 4,000 or the, the, the extra 4,000 would be causing too much grief. Um, for, for, the, for the general public to, to, to stand or for the public to stand not the general um, so moving on to the next bit um, so we've got a lot about um, objections to beaver reintroductions from farmers and landovers um, Robin just put in that farmers and land managers have had bad past experiences of managing protected um, species in a workable way um, what is the best way to sort of to, to, to make this work and, and happen and be yeah, just accepted by everyone, I guess. Accept is the wrong word. Yeah, I, I think I think part of this is, is around really good engagement, really honest engagement, showing people what it actually means to have beavers in a landscape. Um, and we've got enough little examples across Britain now 
uh, to do that pretty effectively uh, on, on a homegrown basis. Um, I think that um, uh, we should be asking the right questions. You know, I, I don't think we're. I don't think my question to a farmer is, or to, to the farmers in a in a in a catchment is, would you like to have some beavers on your land? My question would be, can you tolerate this animal uh, being on your land or transiting your land? And if so, can you agree? to talk to the beaver management group or the beaver officer before you re reach for the shotgun if they do something you don't like. Uh, so that, that, that's one thing. And then the next thing is to make sure that we've got the support in place, um, which is uh, really quick to react so that on the one hand, we can be teaching people about what to do about, let's say, tree protection. Um, you know, we, no one wants to have all their trees knocked over, I'm sure. And there will be some, though, which are really high value, either for sentimental reasons or for environmental reasons or for economic reasons. Um, and we need to be able to show people how to protect those trees for themselves because they can do it. You know, there's, there's nothing about that that you, you, you need um, a, a gang of people to come along and do for you, even though it's nice. You know, a lot of these things you can just do for yourself cheaply. Um, so, so there's that. And then the other thing is, when things do go wrong, you better make sure someone is there within 24 hours to, to uh, uh, begin the, 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 uh, the management stroke mitigation uh, required. Um, yeah, a really honest response, sir. I appreciate that. Um, we have had a few questions. So say if you had land um, and you were interested in having beavers on your land, how much space would you realistically need? Um, how and how, what would be the process of, of the sort of next steps? How would you go further with that? Um, well, if if you wanted to uh, uh, put some beers in an enclosure on a sort of trial basis, uh, we're moving to a stage now where you better have a really good reason for that. That's going to have to actually answer some uh, some questions that we don't know the answers to yet. Um, so, so that, that's the first thing. Natural England, amongst others, are now really keen, I think, to see the next stage of the beaver's return, which is uh, a licensed wild release. So in a way, you're almost asking the wrong, wrong question, how do I get beavers on my land? What it should be is, how do we get beavers back into this catchment? And that is going to require uh, first off, I, I would submit um, a very close connection with your uh, local wildlife trust. Uh, I think uh, uh, liaison with Beaver Trust, uh, with Natural England uh, and so on, even before you start to think about getting a license, just to uh, discuss the whole thing and try and get your head straight about that, about that and what it's going to mean of you, because um, while Beaver Trust can very easily come in and give advice and can work up a license and that kind of thing, there's an awful lot of work that will need to be done on the ground, which we are neither resourced uh, and, and nor really should we be doing. Um, that's to say, uh, the, there will have to be a, a demonstrable uh, amount of support for this um, for it to go forward. So uh, you, you're going to need to be. That's why I say get hold of people like your local wildlife trust, because for an individual uh, or a, a farmer, it's too much. It's too much stuff there to, to be thinking, to, to be um, going through the whole thing by yourself. We need we, people need to be thinking much more broadly and uh, forming groups uh, to start to make this sort of thing happen, and including eventually a, a formal steering group and a formal beam manager group and so on and so forth. So, so we can give you all the advice in the world and can provide professional services, but the, the, the social side of it is, is immense um, in my view. Is, is that answering the question? Yeah, I, I think so. I think it's not a very clear answer because it's a very new process. Um, I think 
basically get in touch with all the organizations with with Booth Trust and 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 everyone basically and yeah. sort of get everyone on the side and yeah. you need to make sure that it's suitable for that area as well um yeah. Rebecca's asking um can she just assume that beavers will naturally migrate into her river eventually anyway which I'm um, again on the long term maybe <laughs> yeah I, I I I think realistically um uh as I say we've got beavers in 10 rivers at least in England now um yeah I mean, the answer is probably given long enough yes but it could still be hundreds of years for that for that to to happen um uh, and I'd say if I'd say if you're in the southwest if you're in Devon or Cornwall or Somerset or Dorset yeah the chances are you're going to get beavers in most of the rivers there um even just by by natural expansion uh over the next 20 to 30 years i think that's just going to happen um if you're nowhere near any of those uh, uh places yet you know if you're in um i don't know uh shropshire i think that will be a little while yet um but that they, they they will they will come but we should ask ourselves Given what we know about the incredible environmental uh, uh, things that, that, that the beavers uh, do, the, the ecosystem services they provide, can we afford not to bring them back in a much more business-like way and quicker? Um, that would be my, my sort of retort. Yeah, um, thank you. I, we're, we're kind of at the end now. Um, we, we've run out of time. I've got so many questions in the chat. And what I'll probably do, um, Chris, is I'm going to take them all out for you and I'll just show you because it might be something you might be interested in talking another day, uh, another talk, perhaps. I think you've got so much that you could talk about. Um, we could be here all day. Um, unfortunately, we don't have that liberty. Um, we've got people who have to go back to work now as well. Um, they've come in on their lunch and now have to, to bail yeah. out. OK, um, I, I didn't put my... Um my email up, which is a uh, uh, neglectful. It is chris at beavertrust.org. Please, please, if anyone out there has got uh, uh, any questions, do do tell them to email them through. Do send through what's in the chat and I'll have a look at that as well. And uh, you'll be always pleased to come to come and uh, talk about, about this, particularly uh, uh, maybe on, on some more directed area of, of, of beavers. No, definitely. Um, I've just put that in the chat. Um, so that's super. Um, just to let you know, um, this will all be recorded. So you will be sent a link when we get to upload this probably early next week. Um, so we'll have all the links that we've posted in the chat um, will be in that as well. Um, and it will be sent to you directly through Eventbrite, I believe. Um, Chris, is there anything you want to say before um, we end this call? Just just thanks so much, everyone, for coming. And um, uh, let's hope we can get beavers and a lot more rivers in the next few years.